The subject for today is really a continuation of some things that I've been doing in the last couple sessions that I've had with you, uh, and it's on the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. And we've been looking at the day of the Lord from uh, multiple angles, if you will. We're looking, we looked at it through the eyes of Peter and Paul. We've looked at it through Jesus and his teachings, and we're going to touch on those uh, again today, the teaching of Jesus that relates to the day of the Lord. But when I say the day of the Lord, once again, for those of you who weren't here and just as a point of review briefly, when I say the day of the Lord, you should know that the day of the Lord is a future period of time where God is going to war on the earth to bring history to a proper consummation, a righteous consummation. But when God does that in this future time known as, or this period of time known as the day of the Lord, there'll essentially be three things that will be accomplished. The first will be the rapture of the church. So the day of the Lord is always connected to the rapture of the church. Okay, so they are inseparably linked And we'll see that more as we move on today. The second is divine judgment of the wicked. Divine judgment of the wicked. Where God goes to war on the earth, pouring out his judgment on those who have rejected his grace and spurned his love and have shaken their fist at the creator in rejection of him and his son. Divine judgment of the wicked. And the third is Christ's physical return to the earth. Jesus Christ, just as he came the first time, was born in Bethlehem, lived on earth, died, and rose again. He is coming physically. The first time he came as a lamb, the second time, which we look forward to, he will return as a lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of King David. He is coming as a warrior king a warrior king, and he will establish a literal, physical, 1,000-year kingdom on the earth. So when we say day of the Lord, you should know this is a future period of time, brief in duration. We don't know exactly the length that it will be when God raptures the church, pours out divine judgment on the wicked, and establishes a physical, literal, earthly kingdom. Now, in the study as we move forward today, we're going to be looking at a variety of different things, but what I want you to understand is our goal here. There are lots of areas that we, could, that we can focus on, but what I, the reason that I'm bringing you on this path today um, is because, again, I'm trying to show you different angles of understanding the day of the Lord and when the day of the Lord will transpire, when it will occur. We don't know, again, the specific hour or day, but I am assured from Scripture, and you can be assured from from Scripture, that we will know, if we are that generation that are living on the earth during that time, we will know the general time period of when this event will take place or when the series of events will take place. So I want to take you to Matthew chapter 24 once again. And if you were here in the last session, we spent considerable time in Matthew chapter 24, which is also known as the Olivet Discourse. And I'll just give you a little bit of context because when we go to Revelation, I'll also give you some context so that you have a good uh, understanding uh, of, of the events that were taking place when Jesus gave crucial teaching about his second coming to his disciples. So the context... Matthew chapter 24, the previous chapter. Jesus is in Jerusalem. He is in the temple area, large area around beautiful, magnificent. It was the wonder of the world, the temple in Jerusalem, where the Spirit of God dwelt within. And as Jesus was there, he's angered by what he sees taking place in the temple area. And he excoriates the scribes and the Pharisees, for their hypocrisy. He calls them white sepulchers or whitewashed sepulchers, beautiful on the outside with all their adornments, their clothing, their, their tradition, their pomp, their arrogance, and on the inside, they are filthy, smelly tombs. He goes through a series of woes unto them, 
excoriating them for their behavior in front of so many of the other people, the crowds that were there at the temple in Jerusalem. And of course, the disciples are watching all of this. And you can imagine their eyes were wide as saucers when they hear Jesus taking the scribes and the Pharisees, the aristocracy, the religious leadership to task in front of the common people. You can only imagine what it was like. And as you move towards the end of Matthew chapter 23, Jesus pours out his heart. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou who killest the prophets and stonest those who were sent unto thee, how often I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks, lovingly, tenderly, mercifully, but you would not have me. And he says, as a result, your house, your temple for God, is left unto you desolate. And he goes on to say, you shall not see me henceforth until you as a nation say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. With that as a backdrop, Jesus departs from the temple and his disciples, as if to try to salvage something, they say, hey, Jesus, but, but look at the buildings. I mean, they're magnificent. You know, it's the wonder of the world. You know, it's, it's um, amazing. And Jesus says to them, probably in very stern, sober, in a stern, sober response, you see all of these things? You see that magnificent temple? Do you see these massive walls? Do you see all the glorious architecture that's before you? See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be here left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. You want to talk about a shocker for the disciples when they heard those words. So you can imagine that when they got to the Mount of Olives on the other side, across from the temple, they were filled with questions. And they came to Jesus and said, well, tell us, when, when are these things going to be? I mean, you just rocked our world with the things that you've been telling us and what you've just did, what you said to the, to the religious leadership across the valley at, at the temple in front of the crowds, and you say not one stone is going to be left upon another? When is this going to take place? And for the rest of Matthew chapter 24, in the Olivet Discourse on the Mount of Olives, across from the temple, Jesus lays it out for them and gives them a crucial chronology for them and for believers of all time, including for us today. In the previous session, we took you to a chronology of Daniel's 70th week, because in reality, this is what Jesus was focused upon in the description of his coming to his disciples on the Mount of Olives. Now, the framework that we have here, and I don't want to get too far into the, into the weeds, but I, it is important that you understand because you see the title says the chronology of Daniel's 70th week. Daniel was given a prophecy by the Lord of a future period of time. Basically, the, the prophecy that Daniel was given historically, was a 490-year prophecy where God would bring history to a proper consummation, particularly centered around his people, the Jews. The first 483 years of the prophecy brought you up to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. But then there was a break in time, and you and I are living during what is known as the times of the Gentiles. The break in time between the first 483 years of the prophecy given to Daniel until the final seven years, bringing the total prophecy to 483 plus seven at the end. We are still awaiting the time when that final seven years of the full 490 year prophecy given to Daniel will transpire. And that seven-year period of time, ladies and gentlemen, is commonly referred to as the tribulation or the tribulation period. This is the period of time that is seven years in duration, divided up from, from clearly from Scripture into two three-and-a-half-year segments. Three-and-a-half years, three-and-a-half years. As Jesus, now back in Matthew 24 with his disciples, is giving information to them and to us about what will transpire prior to his coming, Jesus is essentially filling in this period of time with three major distinctive periods of time within the seven years. 
The first one that Jesus refers to after he explains things that will be transpiring prior to his coming is what's known as the beginning of birth pangs or in some translations, the beginning of sorrows. Jesus enunciates things that will be taking place and we'll be talking about those in just a few moments. But he tells the disciples things that will be coming prior to his second coming and his return. And he calls them the beginning of birth pangs. Jesus is using the analogy of a woman with child. And he says, these beginning birth pangs, these are the things that will be coming early in the labor. She'll, she'll have labor pains, and these will be early in the process, but you know from those labor pains or those birth pangs that the birth is soon to come. It's not something that happened a thousand years earlier or two thousand years earlier or is transpiring during this age. It's, it's, it's specifically in connection to an analogy of a woman who's about to give birth. So you can't have all the things that Jesus is enunciating that will be transpiring prior to his coming taking place during this age for a thousand years prior to his return. This, the events that Jesus describes in Matthew 24 as beginning birth pangs are here in the context of a final seven-year period. And we'll be filling that in here in just a moment for you. The second series of a period of time within the seven years is what Jesus refers to as the great tribulation. That's the second area that starts at the midpoint and runs an indefinable period of time and is cut short. He says, for the elect's sake, those who are the faithful followers of Jesus Christ, for the elect's sake, those days, what days? The days of great tribulation will be cut short by something. And what will that something be? Cosmic disturbance. And we'll look at that in just a moment. What is important about cosmic disturbance? It is the indicator that the day of the Lord, remember that's our focus for today, that the day of the Lord is about to commence. And what is the day of the Lord? The time of God's wrath. That's the third segment within this full final seven-year period of time. So Daniel and his prophecy given to him by God gives us the full seven-year framework. Jesus, in his Olivet Discourse to the disciples in Matthew 24, breaks that seven years down for us even further and gives us these three periods of time. So the question is, when we get to John's vision... The Apostle John is given a vision in the book of Revelation. And do you know that the vision that John is given in Revelation 5 and 6 perfectly parallels the teaching of Jesus to his disciples in Matthew chapter 24? And John's vision in the book of Revelation, when overlaid with Jesus' teaching in Matthew 24, gives us even more detail as to the breakdown of events that will take place in that final seven-year period of time. So let me give you a little bit of context as it relates to John's vision in Revelation chapter 6. We'll start in chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Revelation 5 if you want to stay with me. I'm trying to summarize as much as I can so that we can move through a little bit more material, but we'll do, probably do a little bit of reading here in a moment. John is caught up to heaven, and he's called, and he sees a vision in heaven. And the scene that he sees in Revelation chapter 5, again, which is the context for what we're about to hear about in Revelation chapter 6, tied to this final seven-year period, John sees God on the throne in heaven. And in his hand, in his right hand of power, is a scroll. And that scroll is sealed with seven seals. What that scroll contains is so important and so voluminous, it's, we're told that the scroll has writing on the inside of it and on the back. And that scroll in the right hand of God the Father sealed with seven seals and you should understand that the seals had a string wrapped around each each one had a string wrapped around the scroll and a wax seal over the string and if you broke 
to try to open that string to get to the scroll, the wax seal would break. Only those who had the power and the authority and the credentials had the right to open or break a wax seal to get to the contents of what was in the document. So here is God the Father. He's holding the scroll. And do you know what the scroll is? The scroll is indicative or representative of the title deed to planet Earth. But it's sealed with seven seals. And there's a universal search made in heaven above, in earth below. And John says that there was no one found worthy with the credentials to break the seals. And you couldn't get to the scroll until you broke all seven seals. They were wrapped around the outside of the rolled scroll. So you would break one, but you still couldn't get to the contents of the scroll. You break the second one all the way through all seven. Once all seven were broken, the scroll could now be unfolded by the one who had the power, the right, the credentials, the authority to open the scroll and to loose those seals. There's a universal search made. And John says, no one was found. And it says, he, he says in the text, I, I sobbed. Doesn't mean, oh, he's a little upset. Uncontrollably, because he understood if there was no one found worthy to open that scroll and to loose those seals, history could not come to a proper and righteous consummation. All would be lost. Humanity would be lost. And one of the angels says to John, John, stop weeping. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed to open the scroll. See, John, you missed something. In all of the search, you missed someone. And John says, I looked and I saw a lamb as it had been slain. A clear reference to God's Son, Jesus Christ, who had the power, the right, the authority, and the credentials to step forward and to open the scroll, to loose the seals, and to bring history to a proper and righteous consummation. So John goes on in this context in chapter 6, and he's telling us what's happening as each one of the scrolls is opened. Uh, seals, excuse me. Each one of the seals is opened. And as each one of the seals is open, there is something that he explains that will be transpiring. Now, when will it be transpiring? Back to our chart. You would think chronologically, if it's talking about the same period of time, and it is, that we would find the first event tied to the breaking of the first seal around the scroll here. Do we? Let's see. The beginning birth pangs is the first section in the chart that we have for the 70th week. We have the Apostle John's teaching. What did John have to say in Revelation 6? The first seal is the white horse and rider, and he represents false Christs who lead men away from God. And that's found in Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. So as John is describing, as the scroll is being opened, um, the seals are being broken one at a time, verse 1, John says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Revelation 6, 1 and 2. That's the description of the first seal as it's broken in the book of Revelation. Now, what does the Lord have to say about this same period of time? Back in Matthew 24, verse 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Matthew 24, 5. So you understand, this is, this is going to be the process by which we're looking at all of the seals 
And then we're looking at the corollary teaching of Jesus in Matthew 24, which is the Olivet Discourse. Do they match up? Okay, the first one obviously does match up. Let's move to the second one. But before we do that, where would we put this first seal as we talked about just a minute ago? We put it right here at the very beginning of the 70th week, this final seven-year period of time. Now let's move on to the next. Again, we're still in the context of that first section of the three sections. You have the beginning birth pangs, you have the great tribulation, and you have the day of the Lord, which is God's wrath, all contained within that final seven years. We're still in the first section, the beginning birth pangs. Let's look at the second seal according to the Apostle John in Revelation 6, 3, and 4. The second seal is the red horse and rider. He is given a sword and has power to conquer through war. What does Jesus have to say in Matthew chapter 24? And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. That's in Matthew 24, 6 and 7a. So you see the parallel. This is the second seal from Revelation chapter 6. As the, scroll, the seals around the scroll are broken, the second one is broken, you have the red horse and rider, which perfectly parallels the Lord's teaching to his disciples back in the Olivet Discourse. Where is that second one? Again, chronologically, white horse and then red horse. Still within the first section, beginning of birth pangs or the beginning of sorrows. The third seal that's broken is a black horse and rider. He's given a scale to measure the food supply and he will bring famine, Revelation 6, 5, and 6. And how about the Lord's teaching in parallel, Matthew 24, 7b, and there shall be famines, Jesus said to his disciples. Where would we place this one? Again, still in the context of the beginning birth pangs, black horse, the third seal. Let's move to the next one. The fourth, the beginning birth pangs, the Apostle John's teaching. Fourth seal is the pale horse and rider. He represents death and pestilence. He kills with sword, hunger, and beasts of the earth. Revelation 6, 7, and 8. And how about the Lord's teaching? Is there a parallel teaching that the Lord gave to his disciples in Matthew 24? Yes, there is. Matthew 24, 7c through 8. And pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these, now listen carefully, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Or in other translations like the ESV would be birth pangs. Birth pangs, okay? So where does that fit in our chart? Right here. So all of these, Jesus says, the ones that he just enunciated corresponding perfectly to the first four seals of the book of Revelation. All of these, Jesus says, are the beginning of birth pangs, the beginning of sorrows. But the hard labor is still to come. Let's continue moving on into the next section of our chart, which is the Great Tribulation. The Apostle John's teaching, the fifth seal reveals a faithful remnant who are martyred for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Revelation 6, 9 through 11. Let's look at the Lord's teaching in parallel, Matthew 24. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Matthew 24, 9. Now, this moves us, this fifth seal, in parallel to the Lord's teaching, into the next section, which is known as the Great Tribulation. But there is something that occurs at this midpoint of, the, of this final seven years. After the first three and a half years, something happens at the midpoint. And that something is the abomination of desolation, also spoken of by Daniel the prophet. And that abomination of desolation essentially is when an individual who here 
signs or confirms a covenant of peace with Israel, which starts this final seven-year period of time. It's the trigger that starts this period of time. Remember the 490-year total prophecy? 483 years of the prophecy took us up to the crucifixion of Christ. We are now living in a period called the times of the Gentiles. But this final seven years is still out there hanging that will be coming at some point, I believe, very soon. What triggers that final seven years to start the clock once again to fulfill the prophecy? An individual will rise to power known as the Antichrist. He will deceive many and he will sign or confirm a covenant with the many. The Bible says most likely those within Israel will sign a peace covenant and that will trigger the start of this final seven year period of time. However, once you get to the midpoint, after you have the beginning birth pangs, you have something that takes place in the middle and that same individual, the Antichrist, who signed that peace covenant, breaks the covenant. And at a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, you remember in Matthew 24, where the disciples said, look at the magnificent temple to Jesus, right? There's going to be another, a new temple that will be constructed in the same location. Whether it's as grandiose, we don't know. It could be something that could be put up very quickly. It could be more of a tabernacle structure. But something that the Jews uh, assemble or construct most likely next to the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Muslim holy sites. That's a story for another day, and it's fascinating what's going on in the world right now between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, but we'll talk about that at another time. Uh, so there will be another constructed temple of some sort that will be there, and Jews will reinstitute the animal sacrificial system, and the Bible tells us at this midpoint that the Antichrist will stop that animal sacrifice at the temple, and he will instead put an image of himself in the temple and demand the worship of Israel and all of those in the earth. He will demand worship that, that uh, people bow down, give him allegiance, and take his mark. So it is this point, this midpoint, this abomination of desolation in Jerusalem, which is the trigger point for the fifth seal which is those who will not capitulate, those who will not worship him, those who will not give them their allegiance, give him their allegiance, they will be martyred. And there will be severe persecution as a result of the events of the midpoint and the abomination of desolation. That's why the fifth seal makes sense where it's located right here, because you have those who will not capitulate to the Antichrist and there is great persecution. There is great pressure. You know, the Greek word for, for pressure or persecution is thlipsis. It's the idea of, my dad tells the, gives the analogy of someone who is being essentially persecuted or tortured. And they're lying on their back, their hands are tied, their feet are tied, and a huge massive boulder is put on the chest. Not enough to kill them instantly, but the struggle, the pressure, of that makes it impossible to continue to get full breaths and eventually the victim dies of suffocation and that's the idea of thlipsis or pre there's a there's a pressure that will become that will come to bear which is perfect in the analogy of a woman who is giving birth at first the birth pangs are coming further and farther between but the pressure continues to build until at this point, you have incredible pressure as she's travailing to give birth. And that's the analogy that Jesus Christ uses. That's the fifth seal. What is it that cuts this period of time short? Jesus said to his disciples, but for the elect's sake, with all of the birth pangs and all of the thlipsis, the pressure and the affliction and the persecution that's coming, he says, were it not for those days being shortened, for no believing flesh would survive. No faithful person on the earth would survive under the oppression and the pressure and the persecution of the Antichrist during this period of time. Except those days. What days? Days of great tribulation. 
except those days were shortened. Is all seven years shortened? You hear this a lot when we talk about these things um, with other people. I hear this quite a bit. Oh, well, then the seven years must be shortened somehow, but we really don't know how. They really don't have a good answer. What's shortened is not the seven years. We know it has to run its full duration to fulfill the prophecy given to Daniel of 490 total years. So what's shortened? The great tribulation is shortened. The great tribulation is shortened. Except those days of great tribulation were shortened, no believing flesh would survive in the world. But for the elect's sake, those, that generation of believers who are living at that time, and folks, it could be us. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. And what will shorten them? Cosmic disturbance. Cosmic disturbance. What is the teaching of the Apostle John? The sixth seal reveals a cosmic disturbance. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Revelation 6, 12, and 13. That's the sixth seal, right in sequence. What was the Lord's teaching to his disciples in Matthew 24 about the same event? Jesus said, immediately after the tribulation of those days. What tribulation? The great tribulation. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give its light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Folks, it couldn't be clearer. The parallels are perfect between the seals explained by the Apostle John in the book of Revelation around that scroll. And remember, the scroll hasn't been opened yet. Only the seals have been broken thus far, the first six. And the, and the Lord's teaching to his disciples, explaining the exact same thing in the exact same period of time. Now, what did the Old Testament prophets say? Because remember, our focus here is the day of the Lord and the timing and start of the day of the Lord. What did the Old Testament writers say? Isaiah said, For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened and is going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Speaking about the cosmic disturbance before God goes to war on the earth. How about Ezekiel 32, 7? And when I shall put thee out, I will cover the heaven and make the stars thereof dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. Joel 2.10. The earth shall quake. Before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Joel 2.31, the sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood. Get the next word. Before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Joel 3.15, the sun and the moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining. How about the book of Mark? Mark 13, 24, a parallel passage to the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. But in those days, after that tribulation, what tribulation is being referred to? The great tribulation. The great tribulation. And when does the great tribulation begin? At the midpoint with the abomination of desolation. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And how about the book of Acts? But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, which we just read. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Here it is again, ladies and gentlemen, before... The great, that great and notable day of the Lord come. So one thing is absolutely, positively certain. That the day of the Lord, which is the time of God's end times judgment on the world. And remember we told you that that day of the Lord is intimately connected to the rapture of the church. And are we appointed unto wrath as believers? No. No. We're not appointed unto God's wrath, but to obtain salvation. How? 
through rapture. Through rapture. So the indication that tells us that the wrath of God, which is what we are exempted from, not the other things, not the birth pangs, not the great tribulation of the Antichrist, what believers are exempted from is the wrath of God. And the wrath of God is synonymous with the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord will not transpire until cosmic disturbance takes place first. Therefore, what has become very clear as we compare Scripture with Scripture is that that cosmic disturbance is what ends, remember, for the elect's sake, those days of great tribulation will be shortened. For the elect's sake, how? Cosmic disturbance will indicate that God is about to invade humanity. But before he does and pours out his judgment on the earth, Christians, believers, faithful remnant, will not go through that wrath, will not be here during that day of the Lord. Just to move forward, we talked about the scroll in the right hand of God the Father. Thus far, in our chart and through these seals, first seal's broken, second seal's broken, things are happening with each one, third seal, fourth seal, fifth seal, sixth seal. The sixth seal is itself cosmic disturbance. It is the sign that God's wrath is an overhanging event about to occur. But you know what? In the scriptures, after Revelation chapter 6, the seventh seal isn't opened in the next chapter. You would expect to find it there, but it's not there. Not until you get to chapter 8, one chapter later, is the seventh seal broken. And what happens when the seventh seal is broken? You can open the scroll. So before that seventh seal is broken, one chapter later, something very important happens. As a matter of fact, two things happen in Revelation chapter 7. And do you know what they are? 144,000 Jews. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel are sealed for protection because they will live through these events on the earth, but sealed by God for protection. The other group, we're told, is a great multitude clothed in white robes, seen in heaven, so large that no man can number them. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the rapture of the church, and it all happens right here. After the cosmic disturbance and the sixth seal is broken, God's wrath is an overhanging event about to occur. But before the seventh seal is broken and his wrath is raining down and poured down on the earth to judge the wicked, something wonderful, epic happens. The rapture of the church. Ladies and gentlemen, in light of the fact that it is so clear in Scripture from the Old Testament writers, the New Testament writers, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle John, and Jesus Christ himself in the Olivet Discourse, it is abundantly clear that God's wrath, which is what we are not appointed to experience as believers, that God's wrath will not begin until cosmic disturbance occurs first. And ladies and gentlemen, cosmic disturbance, something happening to the sun, the moon, and the stars, does not happen at the beginning of the 70th week. That does not occur until well inside the second half of Daniel's 70th week. So ladies and gentlemen, with all due respect for my brethren who I love, who teach a pre-tribulation rapture, they cannot defend that biblically from Scripture. We know from repeated verses of Scripture that we read to you, and there are others as well, that God's wrath does not begin until cosmic disturbance 
occurs first. Now, we've mentioned this to you in a previous session, and I'll just end with this. There are some who realize this problem within the pre-tribulation camp. They understand that the day of the Lord clearly is symbolized or, or uh, announced by cosmic disturbance, and that doesn't take place until well inside that final seven years, in the second half of that seven years. So they want to maintain a gap theory. They want to say, they want to say, well, we know that cosmic disturbance is here, we know the wrath of God is here, but we'll just have a big gap, and we'll still have the rapture back here before the seven-year period takes place. And do you know why they're forced into that? Because they, they make the presupposition that because there is a seven-year period of time that's still in the future, they call it the tribulation period. They just put a label on it. It's the tribulation period. And it's a very small jump to say, well, if it's the tribulation, it all must be God's wrath, and we're not appointed unto God's wrath. So therefore, we have to be raptured over here because it's all seven years is God's wrath. But you just saw from Scripture, all seven years is not God's wrath. This is the beginning of birth pangs that Israel will be facing, will be dealing with. This is, this is the midpoint where the Antichrist uh, says, worship me, bow down, which triggers the faithful remnant will not bow down, and it triggers a great tribulation where the intense birth pains are there, where the intense labor pains are there because the, the woman is about to give birth. Not until cosmic disturbance occurs here do we know for certain that God's wrath will begin here. But it's an indefinable period of time. We don't know exactly when this will be. No one knows the hour or the day. But ladies and gentlemen, you will know the general time period. This is what Jesus was saying to his disciples in Matthew 24. He's saying, you are going to know the general time period of my coming. And he uses an example of a fig tree. And he says, as a fig tree its branches get tender and it puts forth neat leaves, you know that summer's getting close. And he says, the same is true with my coming. When you see these things begin to transpire, which are the beginning of sorrows, you know that my return is getting close. It's a sign of approximation. So, so folks, when people tell you, well, Jesus can come any moment at any time, it's an imminent event to take place and there are no prophesied things that must transpire first, that totally flies in the face of scripture. Scripture clearly tells us there will be specific things that take place, and just as the fig tree is a sign of approximation, so are these things giving us a sign of approximation so that we know the season of Christ's return. And not until cosmic disturbance will God the Father darken the universe. Sun, blotted out. Moon, doesn't give its light. Stars, fallen from heaven. The universe is blackened. And what will break the darkness? The glorious light of Jesus Christ at his coming will shine from the east unto the west and every eye will see him coming in the clouds of glory. Okay, so um, I must end there. And uh, I apologize, I do have to dash. I'd love to chat with you afterwards, but uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these men of old that were inspired by your spirit to write these truths down for us. We thank you for the freedom that we have to meet, to, to study these things, to learn. Um, just, just the freedom to have a Bible um, and the ability to have a Bible. Um, to be able to open it and to study and to know um, what is coming and for us to be prepared. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your, your ultimate sacrifice of sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, to take our place on the cross of Calvary so that our sin penalty was paid by him. We thank you that he rose again on the third day and that he is coming back victorious as a warrior king to rapture his people, his faithful followers. And those who have died, they will rise first in Christ. We thank you that you are victorious and you are triumphant. It just hasn't happened yet in the eyes of us as those who are living here on the earth, but we know it is assured, we know it is coming, and we know that you will reign victorious. We thank you for all that you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.
Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at 1-888-888. 7819466 Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.